During the 1920s, the U.S. government funded an expedition led by the renowned couple, Nicholas and Helena Rorick, into the remote Tibetan Himalayas. The actual reasons behind this exploration remain a subject of ongoing debate. Nevertheless, some speculations suggest that the mission aimed to uncover the fabled ancient underground civilization in the Himalayan mountains known as Shambhala. Shambhala has been an integral part of Tibetan traditions for millennia. It's a term derived from Sanskrit which translates to place of peace or place of silence. In neighboring regions such as Mongolia, India, and China, there are similar stories of a mystical realm. Within this realm, there exists an advanced civilization of beings who possess both extraordinary technology and spiritual wisdom, often likened to gods. Shambhala is known by various names in different cultures, such as Forbidden Land, the Land of White Waters, Land of the Living Gods, and even the Land of Wonders. It's particularly famous as Agartha. Agartha is widely regarded as the principal city within Shambhala, an extensive underground network believed to be inhabited by advanced civilizations that managed to survive a catastrophic event thousands of years ago. References to Shambhala exist in the most ancient Hindu and Buddhist scriptures, treating it as a tangible reality. Detailed accounts mention a lineage of 32 rulers, a population of at least 20,000 during the city's construction, and its geopolitical history, recorded in the ancient Buddhist text known as the Kalachakra Tantra. Furthermore, the pre-Buddhist religion of Tibet, called Bon, also describes a similar civilization, locating its entrance to the west of Mount Kailash. While many modern Buddhists claim that Shambhala exists purely in a spiritual dimension, it's evident that in earlier traditions, it was believed to be physically accessible. The challenge lies in uncovering this hidden kingdom situated in one of the most uncharted and extreme regions on Earth, the Himalayan Mountains. Nicholas Rorick was among the passionate believers in the existence of Shambhala. In 1924 to 1938, he led a famous expedition which was known as the Central Asia Expedition. He publicly declared his primary purpose as the research and preservation of the cultural heritage found in these distant regions. While there may be some truth to it, the evidence from the Rorick's journals, paintings, and the extraordinary events they experienced during their journey strongly suggests that their primary objective was to locate the entrance to Shambhala. This notion is further supported by the fact that the couple were adherents of theosophy, a spiritual belief centered on the idea that a group of masters would unite all of humanity. Supported by American sponsors, he headed an expedition that included his wife and children, exploring extensive regions of Central Asia, encompassing Tibet, Mongolia, and Siberia. During this expedition, they mysteriously vanished somewhere in the Himalayas, leaving a gap of over 12 months in their recorded activities. The information available is limited, with scant journal entries mentioning sightings of a flying saucer and the discovery of a magical stone, among other fantastical occurrences. Many might dismiss these accounts as mere fantasies. While their expedition was publicly perceived as a failure, there may have been more to it behind the scenes. An indication of this is the 1933 expedition, which received funding directly from U.S. President Franklin Roosevelt. During this expedition, the Roricks vanished once again for a period of three months in the Himalayas. If there were individuals with the potential to reach Shambhala, the Roricks would be the most suitable candidates. In fact, there is a belief that they may have indeed made the actual discovery of Shambhala. Nicholas and Helena Rorick, a remarkably capable couple, were both talented individuals. Nicholas, a prominent Russian painter, writer, archaeologist, theosophist, philosopher, and public figure, drew inspiration from Russian symbolism during his early years. Russian symbolism was a spiritual movement that deeply impacted his formative years. Rorick's fascination with hypnosis and various spiritual disciplines is reflected in his paintings, which are renowned for their mesmerizing and hypnotic expressions. He was born in St. Petersburg to a prosperous Baltic German father and a Russian mother, spent his life in different locations worldwide until his passing in India. Throughout his journey, he remained a passionate advocate for safeguarding art and architecture amidst the ravages of war. His relentless efforts earned him multiple nominations to the long list for the Nobel Peace Prize. Helena was equally talented as well. 
She was a Russian theosophist, writer, and public figure. She played a significant role in the early 20th century by collaborating with the teachers of the East to establish a philosophical teaching known as Living Ethics. Beyond her intellectual pursuits, she actively engaged in organizing and participating in cultural activities in the United States. Her roots were traced back to a family of prominence, as her father, Ivan Ivanovich Shaposhnikov, was a renowned architect in St. Petersburg. Some accounts suggest that years before, Helena had received telepathic instructions compelling her to embark on the quest to the hidden kingdom in the Himalayas. These instructions were said to come from Moria, one of the masters of ancient wisdom within the theosophical beliefs that she ardently followed. Convinced of the actual existence of Shambhala, the power couple decided to undertake the journey, even though they had successful careers. In December 1923, the Rorik, together with a crew of six associates, started their daring five-year journey. They've traversed 35 mountain passes, ascended 21,000 feet in elevation, and covered 15,000 miles of uncharted roads. Tragically, five of their associates lost their lives during this hazardous expedition. The Himalayas presented an extreme and treacherous environment, known for their bitter cold, challenging terrain, and lack of hospitable resources. Adding to the difficulties, Tibet had become an independent, war-torn state a decade prior, closing itself off from the outside world. Foreigners venturing into Tibet faced enslavement, torture, and death at the hands of draconian authorities. Moreover, the mountains were infested with bandit groups and rogue warlords, to ensure their survival, the Rurik eldest son George, who was well-versed in Tibetan culture and languages and a skilled military tactician, took on the vital responsibility of protecting the family. Much of what we know regarding their expeditions were recorded in Nicholas's two diaries. One was focused on scientific observations, while the other delved into esoteric accounts. Additionally, he managed to create over 500 paintings during the expedition. Without their awareness, British, American, and Soviet spies closely monitored every move they made until they vanished. The team's passage through the Taklamakan Desert, known as the Heart of Asia and one of the largest sandy deserts globally, proved exceedingly challenging. They faced dangers such as caravan looters and deadly poison grasses, leading to the loss of their horses' lives. As time passed, months stretched into years. According to Nicholas's chronicles, he had a strong feeling that they were approaching the entrance of the secretive inner earth kingdom. He meticulously recorded eerie events of fire and enigmatic lights that illuminated their campsite. Of particular fascination is the fact that, according to legends, as individuals approached Shambhala's entrance, their thoughts grew increasingly hazy due to the potent aura of the city that influenced their minds. This aura possessed a spiritual power and physical complexity beyond mortal comprehension. In Nicholas's case, it seemed as though he was in communion with a formidable entity, as his paintings relentlessly portrayed a figure he believed to be the messianic ruler of Shambhala, the one destined to bring about the ultimate destruction of the wicked, the renewal of creation, and the restoration of purity. As Nicholas experienced these potent visions sent by the ruler of Shambhala, he found himself identifying as the reincarnation of the fifth Dalai Lama. This newfound connection allowed him to sense the presence of Shambhala more deeply. In Tibetan Buddhism, the Dalai Lamas, revered spiritual leaders, are believed to directly channel energy from Shambhala, establishing an inherent and profound link to the mystical realm. Among the last events documented in Nicholas's diary was a remarkable sighting, a description of a flying craft witnessed by seven members of their crew. This observation holds significance as it occurred a full 24 years before UFOs became a matter of widespread public interest. On August 5th, something remarkable. We were in our camp in the Kukunor district, not far from the Humboldt chain. In the morning about half past nine, some of our caravaneers noticed a remarkably big black eagle flying over us. Seven of us began to watch this unusual bird. At this same moment, another of our caravaneers remarked, There is something far above the bird, and he shouted in his astonishment. We all saw, in a direction from north to south, something big and shiny reflecting the sun, like a huge oval moving at great speed. Crossing our camp, the thing changed in its direction from south to southwest, and we saw how it disappeared in the intense blue sky. 
We even had time to take our field glasses and saw quite distinctly an oval form with a shiny surface, one side of which was brilliant from the sun. Following this incident, the Rurik and their entire crew vanished without a trace, seemingly disappearing from the face of the Earth. Despite being under close surveillance by Soviet, American, and British intelligence, all communications abruptly ceased, leading the world to believe that the Rurik had perished. The only account available of this period comes from Nicholas's diary, revealing that the last five months of their journey were spent enduring the harsh conditions of a Tibetan prison camp, where the brutality was so severe that only one out of their six crew members survived. This unfortunate revelation, however, leaves more than seven months of their mysterious year unexplained and unaccounted for. In 1928, they were eventually released, and Rorik quietly returned home. At first glance, one might hastily conclude that their expedition was an utter failure. However, upon closer examination, legitimate reasons arise to question whether they had indeed accomplished their intended mission and possibly discovered the hidden city during those elusive seven months. For one, a peculiar entry in Nicholas's diary emerged when it was made public. In the remote valley of Umon, an old monk guided them to the back of a temple, where a substantial cave entrance was carefully sealed with stones. The monk asserted that this was a sacred gateway to the inner earth realm of Shambhala, and strictly forbade their entry. Secondly, the Roriks were sent back to the Himalayas for a follow-up expedition from 1933 to 1935. One might wonder why they would be entrusted with another expedition if their initial attempt had been deemed a failure. Remarkably, this second expedition bore the direct approval of U.S. President Franklin Delano Roosevelt and was funded by Henry A. Wallace, the Secretary of Agriculture and future Vice President, who regarded Nicholas as his guru. During the second expedition, they disappeared once more, this time spending three months deep within the Himalayan mountains, and no documentation exists regarding their activities. The highest office of the U.S. government directly supported the second Rorik expedition. The Roriks were tasked with the collection of drought-resistant plant specimens. This was particularly intriguing due to the fact that Rorik weren't scientists. Their expedition undoubtedly evoked diverse political responses from different nations. However, certain theories propose that Rorik's purpose was to undertake a quest to bring back a mystical Chintamani stone to Shambhala. This notion was strengthened by a letter written by Wallace to Rorik, where he alludes to the stone and its speculated ability to establish a new world order. And I have thought of the admonition, Await the stone. We await the stone, and we welcome you again to this glorious land of destiny. In 1928, the year the party vanished, it is believed that Nicholas came into possession of this mysterious stone. One of the supposed strong links for this is that the Tibetan symbol for the Chintamani is the pyramid of triple circles, and the same imagery was used on Rurik's banner. The Chintamani stone has been a subject of fascination for treasure hunters, captivating the human imagination across generations with its tales of being a wish-fulfilling jewel that has circulated worldwide. These legends likely originated from Hindu and Buddhist traditions, drawing parallels to the Western alchemical concept of the philosopher's stone. In Mahayana Buddhism, this sacred jewel is believed to be possessed by those on the path to Buddhahood and by Buddhist monks. In the Tibetan Buddhist tradition, the Chintamani is often depicted as a radiant pearl held by the Buddha himself. These jewels are believed to possess the power to alleviate poverty and suffering. Buddhists believe that the stone came into the custody of the enlightened and was taken to Shambhala. A king will emerge from this place to bring forth the Golden Age. Could this be the motivation why Nicholas embarked on a journey into the Himalayas? Alternatively, some theories propose that the Chintamani stone was brought to earth by Syrian missionaries, said to be extraterrestrial beings originating from the star Sirius. According to this view, their mission was to aid in the creation of a unified global civilization built upon principles of mutual support and equality. While concrete evidence of its existence remains elusive, the Chintamani is believed to be composed of Moldavite, a type of glass formed by a colossal meteor impact in the Czech Republic approximately 15 million years ago. Moldavite is reputed to amplify psychic and healing energies in the eyes of some. Furthermore, 
It is speculated that the Emerald Tablet, which contains alchemical instructions for transmutation and is associated with the creation of the Philosopher's Stone, could also be made of Moldavite. While it remains a topic of debate whether the Rorik ever reached Shambhala, there is a compelling theory suggesting they might have acted as double agents. Funded by the Americans, they may have been covertly searching for the hidden kingdom on behalf of Soviet occultists. Scholars specializing in modern Russian history have extensively written about the Russian government's intense interest in the resources believed to be held within Shambhala, rooted in a profound belief in an ancient Tibetan prophecy. This prophecy foretells a future wherein humanity deteriorates due to materialism, and the surface dwellers unite under an evil king. At this critical juncture, Shambhala emerges from hiding, and its 32nd ruler ignites a war wielding potent magical weapons to utterly defeat the malevolent king and his forces, ushering in an era of lasting peace among people. The allure of these mystical weapons fascinated the ascending world powers, Russia, Britain, Japan, and the U.S. Even U.S. Vice President Henry A. Wallace eagerly awaited the Chintamani fragment's delivery, expressing enthusiasm and welcoming the Rurik to the United States. While the Rurik expeditions were indeed funded by the U.S., they undoubtedly maintained some ties to their motherland, Russia, possibly including contacts with the head of the Soviet secret police, Gleb Boki. He was an ardent occult enthusiast, was deeply invested in discovering Shambhala for its knowledge, technology, and magical weaponry. He operated a secret Soviet laboratory, experimenting with Buddhist spiritual techniques in an endeavor to engineer the ideal communist human being. Boki had ventured into the Himalayan peaks himself to search for Shambhala, orchestrated a large-scale expedition for the same purpose, and even sought to harness the Hidden Kingdom's resources for the glory and global supremacy of the newly formed USSR. Although his attempts at an expedition to Shambhala were thwarted by political rivals, Gleb Boki might have found a convenient solution in the Rorik. Despite their distrust of Bolshevik communists, their multi-year Himalayan journey necessitated significant financial and logistical assistance, making their detour into Russia and visit to Moscow in 1926 suspicious. This has led to speculation that the Rorik could have acted as double agents for the Soviets, delivering information and artifacts to the Soviet secret police before continuing their journey. Undeniably, there was a political aspect to the Rorik expedition, and they may have been playing both the U.S. and Russia to support their mystical agenda, which would have been unfeasible without such powerful sponsors. However, it's possible that they were not primarily driven by political motivations. Both Nicholas and Helena demonstrated profound concern for peace between nations and cultural preservation. The debate regarding whether the Roriks actually reached Shambhala and spent substantial time in the kingdom remains open to discussion. Nevertheless, Nicholas Rorik left a significant legacy in the form of the Rorik Pact, which received personal endorsement from President Roosevelt in 1935. The pact was initially formulated after Rorik's initial journey to Asia, at the heart of the Rorik Pact lies a crucial concept, the recognition of the utmost importance of preserving cultural artifacts, prioritizing their protection over any military motives that may exploit or destroy them. This pact emphasizes the safeguarding of cultural heritage above all military considerations. We all unanimously agree on the significance of preserving cultural artifacts, particularly when they hold as much power as the Chintamani Stone. What are your thoughts about this? I hope you like our story. Until the next one.